personally the cleansing. He was on his hands and knees, the supreme personality of God, was cleaning the Galatian temple. They cleansed the whole temple as much as they could. They washed the walls, they washed the ceilings, they washed the deity room. Every place of the temple was cleaned, and they went out into the courtyard and cleansed the temple. The courtyard also. After everything was done, Lord Chaitanya says, we have to do it again. And this time, it was like trying to find those particles of dust and dirt that were missed at the first time. And Lord Chaitanya was awarding everyone great plates of Maha who can find the most dust. And he was there with his, he took his chara off and he was cleaning everything. And people, the devotees were bringing him buckets and everyone was cleansing, 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 cleansing. And Lord Chaitanya found more dust and more particles of dirt. They were going into the tiny cracks in the wood. <laughs> And wherever in the stone and just scrubbing it and cleansing it so it's so clean. There was nothing, there wasn't, dirt wasn't even non-existent. There was no, nothing left. And Lord Chaitanya taught this particular pastime to show that the temple is the heart and the process of bhakti is to cleanse the heart. But how to cleanse the heart? in such a way that you, you don't leave those fine particles of dust and dirt in there. Lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, envy. These are the big clumps of dirt. <laughs> and you can see them, and you can recognize them, and you can get rid of them. But the ones that are more finer, more subtle, such as Diplomacy, pretense, deceit, the desire for fame, the desire for honor, the desire for recognition, are like the finer, finer particles of dust within the heart. And Lord Chaitanya was cleansing the temple to show that in order for the Supreme Personality of God to actually appear within the heart of the temple, everything has to be cleansed, even the finer. So Raghunath Das Goswami is getting to the real dust particles you now, the ones you can't see. These are so fine that you can't see them, but they're there. Sometimes others can recognize them in you, but you can't see them yourself. They're so fine. And here it is. Okay, so you're going to chant the verse together? Okay. You're all okay for this verse? Okay. So now he's going on to say, I'll, I'll read the sixth verse for those who weren't here, just to give you a little understanding of the sixth verse. The sixth verse is really nice. He says, Oh, roughy in mind, why do you burn yourself and me, Why do you burn yourself and me? The, soul, the soul by bathing in the trickling urine of a great donkey? A full-blown hypocrisy and duplicity. Instead, you should always bathe in the ocean of love emanating from the lotus feet of Sri Sri Gandharvika Giridhari, thereby delighting yourself and me. So we heard, what is that donkey you <laughs> It's uh, presenting oneself in a very, well we say, external way as a devotee, but internally harboring material activities, material desires. 
the donkey or and then he mentions for the householders and for the renunciates. And we went over that. And now now this is the final verse in the cleansing part. Now even finer than that one is this one. Can you get any finer than that? <laughs> we can. Here he goes. Ready? As long as the unchaste Dog eating woman, dog eating woman, of desire for prestige dances in the heart. How can the chase and pure lady, of love for Krishna, touch it? Therefore, O oh mind, you should always serve the incomparable. Beloved devotee, commander of Krishna's army, who will immediately throw out this unchaste woman and establish the pure lady of love in the heart. So, in the heart is this dog eating lady. How did she get there? We invited her. <laughs> and what is, what is her business? Her business is that this is the desire for fame. Wanting to be recognized. Wanting to be, as we say, honored. Wanting to be, what we say, glorified. Sometimes, even in this world, we see people who have no popularity will connect with someone and find a person that glorifies them. <laughs> Sometimes people even get married like, because of that. Because nobody likes me. At least if I have a wife, she likes me. She has my clothes. Or if you can't even get that, sometimes you get a dog because the dog will, you know, listen to you. They try to get a dog that listens. So in other words, everyone wants recognition. It's deep. It goes within the heart. It's called Pratishta. Madhavendra Puri, great devotee of the Lord. He was traveling to Jagannath Puri in order to get sandalwood paste and what was the other item? Camphor. Camphor for his deity. Uh, what was his deity's name? Gopal. Yeah, Gopal. So he came to Shir Kaur Gopi's Nath's temple on the way there in Ramuna. He stopped there. And he stayed, and he was watching the offering, and they were offering care regularly to, to Gopinath. It was a regular offering in the evening. They were offered these pots of care. So while he was watching the offering, he was thinking, I would like to offer that to Gopal. But then he caught himself. Oh. I'm thinking about that, the offering, while it's being offered. This is not good. This is an offense. Because we understand that we take the reverence of a Christian each, and we don't try to think about it, or even to taste the person, we don't taste it. But even to think about it before Christian gets it, this is a subtle form of an offense. So he was thinking, oh, I'm thinking about Krishna's offering while it's still being offered. So he left. He left the temple, didn't say anything. He, he went to the village and just started to chant Jaka. That night, after the offering, um, the Pajari came onto the altar to take the plates away. The pots, they were actually pots. And then, the Pujari went to sleep. And then the Pujari had a dream. And in the dream, Gopinath appeared to him and said, I have hidden 
one of the pots of offering. In my cur behind my curtain, you didn't see it. Come and get that and bring it to Madhavendra Pur. The Lord arranged personally that he would get the offering. So the Pujari woke up, went, and there behind the curtain in the corner was a pot of sweet rice. He was so happy. He then he took the pot of sweet rice and the next morning he went looking for Madhavendra Puri. Gopinath, Gopinath is asking, where is Madhavendra Puri? He has brought the sweet rice for you. Where is Madhavendra Puri? Where is Madhavendra Puri? Madhavendra Puri heard his name. He chanted, so he came. And the Pujari immediately embraced him. They embraced each other. He said, Gopinath is taking his offering. He wants to give it to you here. Madhavendra Puri was amazed. Yes, he was also very humble, but he accepted it because it was the Lord's mercy. And he took, in fact, he ate the sweet rice and broke the pot, and he kept the pieces of the pot, and every little, every day he would eat a piece of the pot. I remember we once went there, and we How many you been to the Oh, anymore? You didn't go to Ramona? Do you have to You have to go to Ramona. It's a very, very special place. They offer this cure even today, near Korangopia. And we were there many years ago with the Yatra with many devotees. And they gave us these little pots of cure. Little tiny ones. And uh, I remember eating it and it was like, was, I, can't, I can't think of it. And other time that I got an immediate, what we say, spiritual realization. <laughs> Just by eating that, it was so powerful, spiritual. And then, I think, we went there a second time. And I made a big mistake the second time. They, they again serviced the pots, we had their little pots, and I finished my pot. And then the devotees came around and started collecting the empty containers. And I gave away my container. Oh boy, I was thinking, what a fool. I didn't recognize it when it was happening. I just thought, okay, they're collecting. Then they were collecting it because they wanted to keep it. Because <laughs> the pot is just as good as what's in it. <laughs> it's not different. Because it gets offered on the altar also. And so this cure is really magical. So when Madhavendra Puri received a special mercy, then the entire town learned what is the greatness of Madhavendra Puri. Gopinath had stolen the cure. That's why he's called Kirakura. Kirakura means one who's a thief. So Krishna actually Stole things for his devotee. He was Gopinath before, now he's Kirakura Gopinath. And so, when Manaventra Puri learned that all the villagers now knew about what happened, he immediately left. In the middle of the night, not wanting to be recognized by anyone, he stuck away. Because he was thinking, if they honor me, that was burst in death. So here's a good, wonderful example. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was traveling through South India, he went to that. He went to the house of the Kuala Brahman. While he was there, one leper, his name was Vasudev. He was a leper, but he was a devotee. He couldn't associate with anyone because of his leprosy. But he heard that Mahaprabhu had come to Kurukshetra and he wanted to see the Lord. He knew he couldn't get close, but he just wanted to see the Lord from a distance. But when he went out to look for the Lord, the word was out that the Lord had already left. He was such an anxiety. He was feeling so bad, so wretched, so unhappy. And he was thinking, just see, Lord, this, this is my misfortune. I just wanted to see the Lord. Lord Chaitanya is the indwelling super soul in the heart of all living beings. 
And so he knew the mind and heart of Vasudev. He turned around, came back, he came right to the place where Vasudev is. He saw Vasudev. He said, Vasudev! He got up, and then Lord Chaitanya came and embraced him with great affection. Upon embracing Vasudev, all the leprosy in his body was completely cured. His body was completely normal and whole. It's described that Vasudev was very humble. And he had leprosy all over his body. And there were worms living everywhere in his body. And one of the worms, if they would fall out onto the ground, he would pick it up again and put it back. Because he was thinking, this is the home of that worm. God has put that worm in my body. That's the home worms and right home. This is this was his humility. Don't try to imitate it. <laughs> this yeah, it's really I mean you can't understand the mind of great souls. This is just his humility. And so when Lord Chaitanya embraced him and all his leprosy was gone, how did he feel? He felt unhappy. Why? He said, my dear Lord, you have shown me your favor. Now I will become proud. I will become proud. I mean, you would think, wow, I would be happy. The Lord embraced me, showed me his favor. My, my disease is all gone. He was thinking, now I will become proud. And therefore he was unhappy. So what did he do? Lord Chaitanya said, Vasudev, there's a formula that you will never become proud if you do one thing. He said, incessantly, that means without stopping, chant the holy names of the Lord, and you'll never become proud. And this is the formula for all of us. That means 24 7. <laughs> Because if you do it while you're awake, you could all day, you'll definitely do it in the sleep too, because it, it'll actually start to come into that area of your existence too. So one who chants the, the holy name always can be free from this dog-eating lady who sits in the heart. But there's another formula, and it's more recommended here. is that one should serve the Vaishnavas. Humble service to the Vaishnavas is the way to destroy this pratishta. Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati says that this pratishta is the worst. Great souls are known for their spiritual achievements, their compassion to others. They're honored for that. They're worshipped for that. They're glorified for that. Their fame is everlasting, but they don't want any of it because they know just to try to take credit for anything is like inviting the dog eating lady into the heart, which destroys the ability to actually love Krishna completely and perfectly. So, this is what uh, Raghunath Das Goswami is saying here. So, this pratishta. We'll speak a little about what it is. It's a desire or hope for honor. Even though one may have dispelled all the other anarthas, you can free from all the other anarthas, it is not easy to uproot Patishta. It nourishes and generates the other forms of deceit. This desire for honor is the root of all anarthas, but since it is never but since it is never able to recognize its own fault. It is shameless. That's why it's called a shameless prostitute. One who has that lady dancing there in their heart can they not recognize the dance. <laughs> it's so subtle, but it's there. Fame is like dog flesh, and one eager for such fame is called Drista Svopacha Ramani, a dog-eating promiscuous woman. <laughs> Um, and goes on to explain more. And she she has a lover. Her lover is deceit. 
that one who actually has her dancing in the heart, desire for personal honor, will also not recognize and cheat themselves thinking that they are okay. I am humble, I am free from all this. So how do you get rid of it if you can't see it? You can't even recognize it. You have to serve the Vaishnavas. Humble service to the Vaishnavas. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati would make his sannyasis clean the bathrooms. You know, the bathrooms in India are not like the ones in the West. <laughs> I think it's a little different. <laughs> he would make his sannyasis clean the bathrooms. Just to help them get become a little bit free from this desire for prestige, for honor. So until humility actually takes root within the heart completely, she, this lady is still dancing there. Now, there's a way to get rid of her and her lover, whose name is Deceit. And that, I'll read about that a little bit. It's mentioned in the verse, it says, O oh my, therefore you should always serve the incomparable beloved devotee commander of Krishna's army, who will immediately throw out the unchaste woman and establish the pure lady of love in your heart. Powerful, incomparable commander of Sri Krishna. The meaning is Prabhu Daiti, a pure servant of Krishna. The rays of the Lord's internal pleasure potency are always reflected in the heart of such a devotee. This potency can very easily flow and accumulate in the heart of another individual, which will cast away any misgivings and help pure love to grow there. This flow of spiritual potency can happen through the pure devotee's embrace, the dust of their lotus feet, for food that is their remnants and their beautiful instructions. So there's four points now. If they, if they give their embrace, the dust from their feet, the remnants of their prashadam, and the instructions they give. So Lord Shiva says, Aradhanam sarvesham vishnu aradhanam kusma param devi tadiyanam Samarchanam. What does that mean? Tadiyanam Samarch. Tadiyanam means those things in relationship. So Lord Shiva is giving a very powerful statement. What is he saying? Jai Shishi Bhunatai Lord Shiva is giving a very powerful statement. And what is he saying? He's saying that service to those things in relationship to Krishna are higher than serving Krishna. What does he say? He says, the best service is to serve the Lord, but higher than serving the Lord is serving the Lord's things in relationship to the Lord, like Tulsi Devi, worshiping Srimad Bhagavatam, serving the Vaishnavas and serving the pure devotees. By serving them and focusing on them, one devotee, one devotee said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I don't have any love for Krishna, but I really love you. <laughs> Prabhupada said, that is perfection. <laughs> so the devotee of the Lord is more dear to the Lord and the Lord Himself. That story with, with Jai and Vijay. When the four Kumaras were traveling through Vaikuntha, coming through the different gates, there were seven gates leading to the inner gate, or the inner palace where Lord Narayan resides. They had passed through six gates, they went to the seventh gate. When they tried to pass, the gatekeepers stopped them, blocked them. They were just boys, 40 years old, but they were true. They were already self-realized. They became angry at these gatekeepers. 
And then they started to say, you know, you don't belong here in Vaikuntha. And so there was, the notice came to Lord Narayan that there was some conflict at the seventh gate. So immediately, not even taking help from Garuda, he immediately came there. And he saw the situation and he understood everything and he said, he said, my devotees are more dear than me. I will cut off my arms, he said that, if my devotees are offended. To offend the devotee means to, re is to really kick the Lord in the head with a big boot. <laughs> it's very dangerous. So therefore the devotees are so dear to the Lord. So in the same way, offense to the devotees destroys your devotional service fast. But take the opposite. Service to the devotees brings you faster and faster to perfection. So you can see, here is the key. So serving, especially it says here, calling out for the pure commander, the pure devotee of the Lord, please save me from this dog-eating desire for honor, which is, she's dancing in my heart, she's having a festival, she invited her, her lover to see, and they are really kicking it up, it's a kirtan. Please kick them out. Prabhupada told us, he said, I can kick out any obstacle. Just come. With my boot, I can kick them all out in a moment. And you might think that's some kind of what, a eulogy or some kind of, what, what's the word, euphemism. But it's not. A spiritual master, especially Srila Prabhupada, we, go, we just go to the lotus feet of Prabhupada and pray within our hearts, sincerely. Not, prayer has to be sincere. If it's done, what we say, as a function, it doesn't have the same result. We offer prayer sometimes just as a function, but sincerely pray to the spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada, please save me from this desire for prestige and honor. Please give me a chance to serve the Vaishnava. This, what we say, utter humility is the only antidote to get rid of these finer particles of dust. So, and the spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada is there for all of us. It's not, he's just the guru of his disciple. He's the guru of everybody in this movement. And everyone has a direct, and I'll say it again, direct relationship with Prabhupada. And in fact, Prabhupada said, the grandfather is more merciful than the father. When the little boy, sometimes he's doing something wrong or he wants something, he goes to the father, the father says no. And then he goes to the grandfather and says, okay, it's okay. It's just the way it is in, you know, family life. Grandfathers, they love the little grandchildren. There's a story. Bhagaji. Bhagaji was a very wonderful Vaishnava who was a local Vrijabhasi living in Vrindavan. And he got connected with Prabhupada in his movement. He was associated with all of the, all the devotees in Vrindavan. So Prabhupada was there. And uh, it was cold. So you know how sometimes in Vrindavan it gets really cold in the mornings. It was really cold. So Prabhupada <coughs> called for halva. He usually didn't eat halva for breakfast, but when the weather got cold, he would want something like some hot grains or something. So Bhagaji was supposed to cook the halva, but then he had some wheat germ. Some devotee from America had brought this bottle of wheat. You know what wheat germ is? For those of you who are not Americans, maybe. It's a kind of like a particles of wheat. How would you describe wheat germ? It looks like black seed. It looks like black 
looks like flaxseed, yeah, but it's all wheat, right? It's finer particles of the wheat. So he had this bottle of wheat germ, and he, and he knew, he knew wheat germ was really healthy. So he thought, I'm going to make wheat germ horrible for Prabhupada. And you know, Prabhupada really liked it. And so, did you get that one? I didn't find the right word. Uh, par fine particles of wheat that is very healthy. In America, especially in the U.S., people buy that stuff and it gives them really quick, fast energy. It's really healthy, good stuff. So he made halibut from wheat churn. He made halibut from wheat churn. And he brought it to Prabhupada. Really proud that Prabhupada died with Jamal. Prabhupada looked at him and said, What's this? <laughs> <laughs> and then he told him, he said, Prabhupada, oh, take it away. <laughs> he wanted real hollow, he didn't want this stuff. So Bhagaji, I mean he put his heart in wanting to peace Prabhupada with this weak chair. And now Prabhupada's rejecting it. So he was really, really overwhelmed with emotion. So he left and he went into the temple, which was right nearby, and he fell at the feet of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and started to pray to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Prabhupada's guru. Oh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, I simply wanted to please your disciple and he was not pleased at all. And he said, he said, I was so upset, I'm so sorry. He was praying like that. And then after he hears a voice, Hey, Bhagaji, Bhagaji, bring the wheat, bring the halva, bring the halva, bring the halva. <laughs> Prabhupada was calling. <laughs> yeah, as soon as he started to pray to Bhakti Siddhanta, the grandfather is more merciful than the father. Immediately, Prabhupada understood, oh, Bhakti Siddhanta is, is telling me I should accept the Buddha. <laughs> okay. And so he did. Of course, Bhakti felt really happy. So, yeah, so we can pray to those of you who are not, who are what we say, Shiksha disciples of, or what we say, uh, Diksha disciples of Prabhupada's spiritual, or Prabhupada's disciples. You have direct relationship with Prabhupada. And he's more kinder to you than he is to us guys. <laughs> That's a fact. It's not, a, it's not a, some nice statement I'm making. So you go to Prabhupada and just pray, my dear Shiva Prabhupada, I have a, I'm struggling with this, uh, whatever it is. Uh, pray for something, I mean sincerely pray. And Prabhupada will arrange. Prabhupada will arrange. Because he's very kind, very merciful. The grandfather is very kind to the grandchildren. <laughs> so you're you're more fortunate than we are who are direct disciples. He gives us he gives us a little more chastisement. Doesn't chastise the grand disciples, just affectionately pass them. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> So you go, pray to Prabhupada. My dear Prabhupada, this lust is really disturbing my own life. I can't get rid of it. Please help me. And Prabhupada will do something. Guaranteed. But we should take this process of prayer very, very paramat foremost, because prayer is very powerful. We sit down and try to chant our japa, and sometimes we struggle. As soon as we stop and start praying for our spiritual master, Lord Chaitanya, and, and Lord Haridas Thakur, and then all of a sudden our japa becomes better. As soon as we start praying, please give me the mercy so I can chant your holy names. Sincerely, we pray to chant the holy names. This is our process. Why does it, it work like that? Because humility 
and submission is the key to opening up all success in emotional service. One who's proud or one who thinks they're okay is KO. Okay means okay, and KO means knocked out. <laughs> we're not okay. <laughs> we're in this material world and we're struggling. We're trying to become fixed in our devotional service. But Maya is there. She's dancing. She's doing her show. You make some advancement. As soon as you make a little advancement, I should tell, I'll say this at the initiation. Uh, those of you who are getting initiated, as soon as you get initiated, expect tests. You'll be getting tested. <laughs> you're getting tested now, but you'll get some more ones. Oh, now you're initiated. You think you're okay. Huh? How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> but why Maya do that for? Just to make you stronger. Tests are meant to bring us, because you go to school, if you don't get any tests, how are you going to even learn the subjects? You've got to pass the test. You have to study for the test. You have to be prepared for the test. So Krishna consciousness is really being tested at the moment. Am I exhibiting the qualities of a devotee? Am I keeping my mind and heart on Krishna? Or am I thinking about worldly things and thinking about how this will happen or how I'll achieve this and all those things? The mind just goes to all these other subjects. So this pratishta is very, very subtle and but with the power the dust of the feet of the devotees, the water that washed the feet of the devotees, the remnants of the food left by the devotees, are three very powerful substances. By rendering service to these three, one can attain the supreme goal of ecstatic love for Krishna. In all the revealed scriptures, this is loudly declared again and again. This is from Chaitanya Charitamrita. I'm reading a direct verse. It says, that if you do these three things, you'll get love with God. <laughs> so, the pure devotees carry completely Krishna within the heart. There's where our success is. And then, it says that to see and her, his mistress, the dog-eating uh, woman, or God. Once the sea is cast away, the living being's heart becomes blessed, and one enters the city of sacred love. Therefore, take great care to keep pretense far away for, from you when you try to acquire the jewels of love. Listen, O mind, to these secret words. As long as my audacious desire for fame in the form of a fallen, low-class, dog-eating woman shall remain within my heart. Her paramour, the sea, will not stop holding sway over my mind. To cast away the dog-eater, hold unto the feet of the beloved devotees of the Lord very carefully and render a lot of service. Bhakti Vinod Thakur weeping asks, When will the commander-in-chief of the Lord take me away chivalrously from the company of the dog eater and give me the treasure of love of Krishna. So any questions? That's, that was Bhakti Vinod Thakur's reflection on that particular verse. Any questions, comments about Bhakti? Gurmaj, uh, in psychology we hear that validation is the need of every human. Is that the same as a desire for recognition? Yeah. In material circles, it doesn't, uh, it has to be there or else people can't continue. Just, you ask everybody to be humble there, they'll think you're crazy. <laughs> but in spiritual circles, 
if you get recognition, you can't stop getting what people want to give you. You don't have to take it. That's the whole thing. When you take it, then that dog eating lady she starts dancing faster. Fame, honor, prestige, no prestige, fame and honor and recognition will come. If you want it, that's the problem. And if you get it, if you don't want it, you get it, and you like it when you get it, although you don't want it, but now it seems to be nice. And then, what, in order to get rid of it, you have to pass it on, or give it to the spiritual master. And you see, what does Bhakti Vinod Thakur say? Amaru Jivan Sade Pape Rate Nahi Yopu Lesa Sade Pape Rate Sade means always, Pape means sinful. There's, my life is very, very sinful. And he's not just making some nice eulogies and trying to get, become popular by being humble. He's saying this is how he feels. The more you make advancement in spiritual life, the more you realize how low you are. <laughs> that is the advancement. And when we get a lot of mercy, that mercy carries us through. If we think we're, we can, you know, we can also see I'm making advancement. But making advancement means opening up love of God. It's not about, you know, achieving something material. If you get it says that getting followers, getting money, getting recognition, getting all these things are not indications of one's spiritual advancement. They may be, but not necessarily. So this um, this desire for validation I think starts from the time of babies when your parents are giving you validation, your teachers are giving you validation. So Can you explain the word validation from your understanding? Yeah, so maybe um you know, don't worry, you're doing a good job or that's you know, that's well done. You're doing great at this, you're so talented at that. So how can we maybe parents of young children or if we have young children in our lives, how can we not feed that dog eating woman and make sure that they are devotional? Well, you can, we, we also praise the bodies. I mean, the, it says in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the 11th canto, the 28th chapter, verse 1 and 2, one should not criticize the devotee, one should not praise the devotee. And then it goes on in the second verse, but they will, but you can praise. Because to glorify others is the nature of Vaishnava culture. We glorify the Prabhupada, we glorify the other Vaishnavas. But the point is your position, if you want these things, that's the problem. So sometimes a person will, will kind of encourage people by glorifying it. Sometimes the spiritual master will do that. Just so the person becomes more and more enthusiastic in their service. It's like, I can talk for myself. If I give a class and the devotees are inspired by the class, I feel more inspired to speak again. But if I feel like, oh, it didn't go well, I have to think, oh, maybe I have to change my way of presenting it. In other words, you, the, re, the recognition and the enthusiasm that you get and the honor and the praise only is meant to increase your service. If it increases your false ego, then that's a problem. It should increase your service, that's all. So we do that to increase some, someone who cooks a nice preparation. Oh, that was so nice. Sometimes we even, we make programs. We honor the devotees. Just like in big festivals, we say, this devotee worked so hard, this devotee did this, this devotee did this, and then everyone says, Jai. 
That's nice. But the persons who are getting the jai, if they're thinking, hmm, about time. <laughs> I've been working the whole three days. I was wondering if they were going to part, make this part of this program or not. I'm glad they included it. I feel better now. Basically, I mean, sometimes we think, well, I'm not working for money, and I'm, I even let some other things go so I can do this. Just a little praise, that's all I really want. No. <laughs> no, that will just build that idea that I'm the doer, and it's my ability, and then the festival of the dog eating lady will be increased, and she'll invite some more friends. So the devotee should think, oh, the, 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 I'm getting some praise. I don't really deserve it. If I did anything wonderful, it belongs to my spiritual master. It belongs to the association of the devotees. Sometimes a devotee will praise another devotee for a particular quality. A devotee will say, because you are such a wonderful devotee, you can see even a good quality in a wretched fool like me. <laughs> That's how the devotee thinks. It's because of your good qualities you're seeing something good in me, which is, and I'm not at all good. <laughs> so that, that's Vaishnav. And we don't just say that to sound nice. Sometimes it's, we want to sound humble. <laughs> but that's another form of pretense. To kind of like act humble just to kind of convince yourself you're humble. Not act humble, but the one we say, speak humbly. You should act humbly, that is, that is important. But humility takes the form of activity. If we're not serving the devotees, you can read every book about humility, you can write books about humility, you can declare a philosophy of humility, but you will not be humble. You have to humbly serve the Vaishnava. This is the only way. You have to fall at the feet of the Vaishnavas and beg for their mercy. This is what it takes. You have to make plans to serve the Vaishnavas. You can't just say, well, <sighs> if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, no, you have to actually actively look for opportunities to serve the Vaishnavas. I have a god sister, she's in America. She goes out of her way just to find ways to serve the devotees. She's a pujari. She gets the maha, and she'll go around every day giving a little maha to different people she meets. She goes out on books. She's so humble that when she was out on books, one person proposed marriage to her. <laughs> She was aghast, and then she didn't, she was thinking, he wants to marry me? And then she went home, fell asleep that night, and talked about appeared in dreams and married her. <laughs> she did. She listened to Prabhupada. She's my age. She's quite elderly. She's so humble, she actually, Prabhupada said, no, I should marry this person. Yeah. With another lady, she was uh, a young girl, and Prabhupada wanted some preaching in, a, in, a, in uh, Russia. There was no preaching. Though. Prabhupada had gone to Russia in 1971, and uh, Prabhupada met that one Russian devotee, Ananda Shakti. Remember Ananta Shakti? Yeah. He was the first devotee. And Prabhupada wanted to help him. So he sent his girl to Russia and said, you marry him. She did it. <laughs> he didn't order her. He just asked her to go. 
And she said, oh, Prabhupada wants me to go to Russia. It was re really hard to get in Russia then in those days because the economy of the Iron Curtain was really strong. Anybody come here? She was, a, she was French. She was from a French country. And she, and she did it. Even today, she talks about that experience. I just saw her in London just when I was there a couple weeks ago. She was there. She's always joyful. She's always joyful. She pleased Prabhupada so much that that pleasing of Srila Prabhupada, when she did that, has been carrying her through her whole life. Prabhupada was so pleased because by doing that, it helped to open up the rest of the preaching in, in Russia. She was like one of the main persons that helped expand the preaching just by marrying Ananta Shakti. And Prabhupada was so pleased, so pleased. He pleased the spiritual master. The path of devotional service is wide open. But if you do something special that's dear to his heart, how wonderful that is in your own spiritual life. So that's what the point of the again is we should look for opportunities to serve and please the devotees. And then we can get rid of this fame. Otherwise, it's just, it's very difficult to somehow or other get rid of the desire to be recognized, to honor, to be praised, only by helping service of the Vaishnavas and praying to the spiritual, the pure devotee spiritual master to help us get rid of this dancing dog lady. Dog, I'm sorry, dancing dog eating lady. <laughs> Can you imagine someone eating dog and dancing at the same time? <laughs> Not very nice. <laughs> but this, these are not what we say euphemisms or what we say hyperboles to kind of like exaggerate what it's going. This is how the acharyas are defining it so they can, we can understand how dangerous these subtle things are. Anyway, I don't want to push the point and make you feel unhappy, but at the same time, is that this desire for recognition is the, what we say, that really deep anartha. It goes deep. And it's hard to recognize, it's hard to get rid of. But the formula is there. Yes, uh, Shivani? Um, I was exactly thinking of the same point that Radha Bhakti raised because, you know, I deal with people and relationships and we encourage people. You can do that, you can do that. But how they take it is up to them. You can do that with devotees too. You can encourage. It's nice. You shouldn't do it in a pretentious way. In other words, you want to be known as a, 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 a praiser. They have people who are professional praisers. <laughs> but, and they want, they make money by praising people, glorifying, call them toastmasters, right? They just glorify people. Yeah, but it's how they, they take it. So we should do it carefully if you want to encourage and praise the devotee. You should do it with sensitivity and not just just whenever you feel like it. But it should be done. How they take it, that will affect them. But you should, it should be genuine from your side. Mm -hmm. It's not genuine. You're just doing it just because you want them to feel good that you are your, their number one official person. Mm -hmm. oh. And um, the, the second uh, I mean, I was just wanting your opinion on this incident. This happened a little while ago. A very senior uh, Srila Prabhupada disciple was visiting us. And he was requested to give the Srimad Bhagavatam class. And about five or ten minutes before class was to begin, he exited saying, um, you can call me when you're ready or some such thing. I wasn't directly involved with that. And uh, 
the young boy who was told I didn't understand correctly or what it was, I don't know. And he went to his room and he stayed there and stayed there and stayed there because this young boy didn't go and call him. And we were all waiting in the temple room for him to show up because he had been told that, you know, and he had agreed to give the class. And he didn't come. And we were thinking, he's going to come, he's going to come, he's going to come, he didn't come. And then finally, somebody else gave the class. Much later on, we asked, what happened? He said, I was waiting for somebody to come and call me. So... He wanted to see how eager you were for class. And you showed you weren't eager at all. <coughs> Not only the boy, but anybody could have came. But nobody cared. It just showed that you were not eager for to hear. He was testing you just to see how eager you were to hear. There was no fault on his part. He just wanted to, he could see there was a lack of enthusiasm for hearing. And so he, he used that just to bring out your enthusiasm, but it didn't work. Well, I was just wondering whether it was just a bit for attention. No, he just did it to, just to see. Sometimes we go to places and people are just not interested and we want to leave as soon as we get there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is, if there's no enthusiasm to hear or to serve, then it's for the traveling preachers and devotees. I don't want to go there. Sometimes they go there just to try to make a difference and get people awake again, shake them off. But only when there's enthusiasm does can a person really speak. There's no enthusiasm. Because what your enthusiasm pulls out from the heart of that person who's speaking, all kinds of things that you need to hear. Because this Krishna was Krishna inspires his devotees to speak according to what is needed to hear. And that depends on your enthusiasm. If you're not enthusiastic to hear or eager to hear, you get less of a class or maybe even no class. We were, we were, I was extremely eager to hear in Guru Maharaj, but I'm being a lady. I couldn't enter the sannyasi, I mean the brahmachari quarters, so I couldn't directly go, and I did understand what dynamics was going Somebody on. Somebody could have won. Okay, thank you. I'm <laughs> not trying to solve the problem. <laughs> no, I mean, this is the way it is. I've seen devotees come to certain, senior devotees come to certain places, and they just want to go as fast as they get there, because the temple's dirty, the devotees are fighting, You had said that the pathway to humility is to serve the Vaishnavas. How about serving a non Vaishnava? Does it bring out humility? Is there a benefit? You mean serving in, uh, uh, a regular person in a Krishna conscious way or in an ordinary way? Either. Well, if you do it in a Krishna conscious way, yeah. If you're like, if you're trying to get, you give them prasadam or you're helping them understand Krishna, that's, that's, that's wonderful. But if you're just increasing their material desires or facilitating their material needs, not necessarily. It's a whole different program because you're not really giving them anything. Somebody else could do the same thing, but a devotee, only a devotee can give them Krishna. Is that clear? Yes, I just needed to know whether it helps us become more humble as well. Well, there is welfare work. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, I'll, I'll, I'll qualify what I said just to get it clear. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was traveling with a group of Grihastas. They were just they were, I think, disciples or part of the congregation. And some people were coming up to them and asking for, you know, bakshish money. Because in India, people, you know, they come and they beg for different, they might beg for money. The Grihastas didn't give anything. 
But he said, don't be chastised. He said, if you don't give, you become hard hearted. Become hard hearted. So sometimes, even in ordinary parlance, or even ordinary things, one should be respectful to the number of people in general. We don't disrespect anyone, and if we can sometimes, it's like I'm traveling to the airport, sometimes I hold the door open for a lady that's coming. Or I'll, I'll just move on a side so someone else can go first. And they appreciate that. Although it's very, it's a pretty ordinary thing. So it's not like, well, I'm a devotee and I can't do anything for the non-devotees, no. When we're interacting, we should be, as Prabhupada was asked the question, how can you tell a Vaishnava? The Prabhupada said, he's a perfect gentleman, or a gentle lady. In other words, he gives respects to everyone. So if you're respectful to everyone, according to, you know, in other words, we're respecting the fact that Krishna's in their heart, and they're part and parcel of Krishna. So we don't, when we say, sometimes Baba be walking in America, and, you know, the Americans are there, Baba said, good morning, good morning, sir. <laughs> Just to be friendly, just to acknowledge another person's existence. And I want to say it. Good morning. So it's not like devotees are just relegated on doing service. We can also do service for the non devotees, but it's circumstance. We don't have to go out of our way to, to look for service like that. But for devotees, you should go out of your way looking for. And for the non devotees, you can go out of your way to give them Krishna consciousness. That, that is also. Hi, Krishna. I wanted to ask you if you can give a little clearance about diplomacy, because you mentioned it is here in a negative context. But I don't know if I remember correctly. Isn't it said that the gopis? are experts in diplomacy, so I'm just thinking about these two ways of how to see that, to so please give a little clearance on that. Well, it's not the goal. Diplomacy implies duplicity. That you, you use, you're saying certain things because you have an agenda. But the, the gopis might speak in what we say, what is the word, ambiguous ways? in order to facilitate Krishna's pleasure. So if it's done for the pleasure of Krishna, just like Prabhupada said, there's spiritual envy, that's good. Oh, this devotee did such nice service. Let me see if I can beat her <laughs> and do better service. Who benefits? Krishna. <laughs> So when you have competition for trying to do better service, Krishna is the gainer. And each of the devotees increase their service and they make it best. But there's no mean spirit. Like, I want to, just like if you're cooking and someone else is cooking, you want to cook better than that person, you don't steal their bogus so they can't cook. <laughs> 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 You know, you actually give that boga, but you also try to maybe make a better preparation. So, so trying to make things better is for Krishna's pleasure. <laughs> there's no mean spirit. And if somebody beats you, and somebody's better than you, gets more praise than you, you think, Jai, wonderful. If you have spiritual competition and someone else is gets more recognition or honor or respect from it, you feel happy. We feel happy when a devotee makes advancement. We feel happy when a devotee gets some mercy. Not like, uh, oh, they got it, what about me? <laughs> no, we're on the same team. The left, you know, the shortstop doesn't end, you know, the left fielder. <laughs> we're on the same team. Anytime someone makes an advancement, you benefit. 
even if you don't do anything, just because we're all working together and trying to serve Krishna, that's the idea. Did you put money? I'll get to you. I'm sorry. <clears throat> now, um, when we speak about humility, and we see Srila Prabhupada's example, Srila Prabhupada was not acting like, you know, Dalai Lama, showing everyone, you know, respects and that. Uh, but sometimes he would very strongly speak, even in public. So, this is also some kind of humility, I mean, some, I would say, uh, this is humility also. So, how to understand this? How we can... It's not the strong speaking, it's humility, it's, it's, it's mood, it's, it's humility. I can speak strong because Prabhupada speaks strong and therefore I'm also humble. No. <laughs> you have to be humble to speak strong and then, then that strong speaking is not contrary to your humility. If you're not humble, you just take on the external, it's not the same. No. But that means that uh, if I speak strongly, that automatically means I'm not humble? You know, if I speak according to what I heard from Prabhupada and Krivita Sacharya? No, it doesn't mean you're not humble. It means that you have, in order for your words to go anywhere, you have to have a certain quality. It says, what does it say? The, the ability to reach others with your words is not simply by making a show, but you actually have to have, you actually, thank Krishna. <coughs> I forgot to put it on airplane mode. <laughs> In other words, <coughs> speaking strongly is one type of preaching. Speaking sweetly is another type of preaching. So it's not about speaking strongly or speaking, speaking, it's about speaking effectively. So you use different ways to speak in order to become effective in trying, trying to reach your audience. So the point is that it's the quality, in other words, what is Prabhupada saying? According to your level of advancement, that's how much you're going to make an impression on other people. What is it? Purity is the force, you say? Yeah. So we should work on ourselves at the same time as we are also trying to help and work on others. So these things have to balance. This is what we were talking about. The external has to be more or less an expression of the internal. I would say that we, in our moment, we, we, have, we have a history where you know, in the beginning, everyone was trying to imitate Shri Prabhupada, and everyone yeah. was heavy. No, but no, now, no. I would say that this, you know, how do you say this, uh, the pendulum went to the other side, and now everyone is trying to be like, you know, humble and, you know, acting like, you know, and it's like, you know, I, I'm so humble, I want uh, every, uh, all the world to know about yeah. that, you know, that kind of mood. You know? Yeah, we're going from one side to the other. Yeah. Therefore, I agree that we should, you know, like a balance more things. And as you yeah. say, sometimes it's sometimes necessary to speak strong. I think it takes, it takes a type of perception of your audience. I think Shivaran Maharaj makes a point in his one in his book, what is it, Bhakti? What is that one? Chintamani Bhakti, Basura Bhakti Chintamani? He yes. makes that point throughout the whole book that one should, one should speak according to the level of the audience. And sometimes the audience is mixed, but generally you try to judge. And if I'm speaking all to Indians, it's different than I speak to Westerners. I try to make that distinction. Because Indians, they know. 
but you have to be reminded. <laughs> Westerners, when you say something, they don't know it. You have to explain it and kind of like, you know, give it all. You have to be. So, speaking strongly, it, it doesn't mean you're not humble if you're speaking strongly, but it doesn't mean you are humble if you're speaking strongly. It has nothing to do with humility, speaking strongly or not speaking strongly. But Prabhupada was humble, and therefore his strong speech, it wasn't so much his humility that made a difference on how he impressed others, it was his concern for that person. He wanted to help that person. His, it was his compassion that made his strong speech acceptable for many. He loves me. People could feel this person cares. If you don't care about a person, you speak strongly. It's a difference, right? It's a difference. So when compassion is there, then one can use different ways to exhibit that compassion according to the nature of the audience. Well, we should be humble. And not like we walk around like this all day and wear a sign. Humility, number one. <laughs> When love is there, then even if there's hard, harsh words, it doesn't disturb the love, the love. But if there's no love or no concern, it's different. That's why Prabhupada told us, I can speak like that, and you can't. He was talking to us because we were new. We weren't. He was saying, when you become like me, and you can speak more like this. <laughs> in other words, when you're actually concerned, look what Prabhupada went through in order to get to where he actually was. I mean, he gave up everything. That's a, it was a sign of complete concern and compassion for the fallen selves. Prabhupada would cry to see people in Maya and physically shed tears. And he told us they're suffering, help them. Protect us. That was his compassion. But when he, when you, when a doctor has to treat a patient, sometimes there has to be surgery, and not always just like giving some prescription medicine. And sometimes the surgery is a little hard for the person to take. Sometimes we have to give an anesthesia with the surgery. <laughs> So yeah, I don't think humility is the point you're making. I think it's more or less understanding how, time and place. It makes sense? Thank you. Some devotees uh, praise, uh, praise another devotee, and uh, uh, how to say? Um, for example, when somebody praises me, and I, I try to tell this is not my my doing, and uh, it, this just enhances the mood that they, they start to praise even more, and I just don't know how to handle this situation. You just get away. <laughs> Vishnu, Vishnu, Vishnu. <laughs> if you're actually feeling like that, then you can do that. If you're not feeling like that, you're thinking, uh, when will they end? Mm. <laughs> it's it's kind of like a chutney. Mm. It's a little saucy, but you kind of, you're taking the sweet side. You're not, 
in my case, I, I can feel that this is a problem for me. And uh, there is also some desire and some fear because I, I feel that this is a, a problem. So maybe it sounds if not, not honest. The thing is, if you, when you get praised for whatever reason, you should know you're, you're in a situation where pride can increase. Then you have to do something. Either get away or in your heart pass it on. You have to do something. You can't just sit there and just assimilate it. Okay. And then we, I think we ran out of time. One more. Michelle. This will have to be the last one. We have to get on to the next program. Um, sometimes I have a problem, especially in English language, uh, when I speak to uh, some person, that it sounds uh, very uh, rough or very hard, that I'm ordering. How to oh, I see. You're, you're using the English language, but you're not familiar with the tonations of it. You don't know how to use it. Because you're trying to learn the language, when you speak it, it doesn't come out the way it should come. Is that it? Yes, because the intention is uh, really sweet, yeah. but it comes out like, do this, do this. You should, you should say, uh, after you're done, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Or say that beforehand. <laughs> or intersperse it in the middle. <laughs> Sometimes we say that we're talking a little strongly and then we, we stop and I really care about you. And then, and then you keep going with that. Uh, just to remind yourself and them that it's not like what it sounds like. Yeah, you can do that. Okay, so we should stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shah. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for the lecture. Thank you for the